Good afternoon, morning or evening, wherever you're listening to this talk. I'm recording it in Boston, Massachusetts, and it actually just started snowing out the window behind me. And so I really wish we were in San Diego this week to do this in person, um, but instead we're doing it remote. And so thanks to everybody for calling in. My name is Bob Ganser. I'm the head of lab automation at Beam Therapeutics. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time today just talking about our philosophy when it comes to automation and why we've really made a push towards fully integrated what some might call complex systems to then run a lot of our experimentation and how we've tried to make them accessible to all of our scientists through the utilization of some software I'll talk about today. So the agenda for today, I'll talk a little bit about myself, not too much, I promise. Talk a little bit about Beam Therapeutics and do some base editing 101. Then I'll spend a lot of time talking about the story of Ursula. So Ursula is our fully automated next generation sequencing platform. It's really the first integrated platform that we've built here at Beam. And I'll tell a little bit of the story about how we built it and the strategy behind that. And then I'll talk about ALAB, a software product from Artificial, and how we use that to then make that complex integrated system accessible to all of our scientists. And then at the end, I'll do a demo. So a little bit about me. As I said, I'm the head of lab automation at Beam, but I also oversee our um, NGS core and lab informatics teams. Prior to my time at Beam, I was actually at the Dow Chemical Company where I oversaw the build out of a few labs across North and South America, and then oversaw some high throughput molecular testing groups. Before that, I was then a forensic scientist. So I worked for a number of companies in forensic science. And you can see my educational background is in molecular biology and biotechnology. I'm not an automation engineer or a software designer or a computer scientist. And then I'm a huge Chicago sports fan. I grew up in the Midwest, even though I live in Boston now. Um, so go Cubs and go Bears. So about Beam Therapeutics, you might not have heard of us. We're a relatively new biotech company. We came out of stealth mode two and a half or three years ago and then went public about a year or so ago. And what we are is we're a next generation gene editing company. So I think at this point, everybody's familiar with CRISPR. Uh, the Nobel Prize this year went to the two discovering scientists of CRISPR. And when everybody talks about CRISPR, they use the analogy of molecular scissors, right? So it goes into DNA, it cuts the double helix, when the DNA is open, then you can do a lot of cool things with it. You can you know, delete sections of DNA, you can insert new sections of DNA, but sometimes you don't wanna cause that double-stranded break. And that's when base editors come in. If we carry on the molecular scissors analogy, we're like a pencil and an eraser. We can go in and specifically change single base pairs within the genome at a precise location without inducing a double-stranded break. So how do we do that? Here's the large, or the you know, high level molecular schematic of how it happens, but basically we use a dead Cas9 or a modified Cas9 molecule and the same guide RNA that you would use to target a particular site within the genome. But then we tether a chemical modifier to that complex and that modifier can then come in and change particular base pairs through the chemical modifications shown there on the right side of the screen. So what's shown there is a C to T conversion or an A to G conversion very high level. If you're interested in learning more about the specifics, go to beamtx.com and you can find all of the published papers, all of the nature papers that have kicked off this company and then all of our published results since then. Um, but that's kind of a high level so you know a little bit of the research uh, that we're doing and, and how we use automation for it. Another high level example of the team that I oversee, the automation team at Beam is really a conglomeration conglomeration of more than just automation and robotics. So we do have a traditional automation and robotics team, but then we also view that holistically where we also incorporate the lab informatics team, the software cloud infrastructure team and the NGS core. So you can see it's more than just your traditional engineering group um, when we think of automation at Beam. All right, now let's get to it. So the story of Ursula, I'll tell the story another time of why the system's named Ursula, but again, this is our fully integrated NGS platform. It's a platform that'll take cells or tissues, do DNA isolation, quantitation, normalization, PCR, NGS library prep, cleanup, pooling, basically everything you need to do to do a base editing or gene editing experiment, short of putting it on the Illumina sequencer to then get your data. 
So the journey of how we got there, so how did we get to this fully integrated system? I think it goes back to when I started at Beam back in 2018, I think I was employee 26 or 27. And at that time we were working at an incubator up the street here in Cambridge and everything was manual. So it's similar to the cartoon that you see there on the screen where we couldn't afford one of those cool PCR robots. So we got an undergrad and a cardboard box. That's the, the world we were living in. Everybody had come from academia, for the most part, hadn't really even used liquid handlers or lab automation and everything was done by hand. So we knew we really wanted to change that culture and we really wanted to go from a manual to quickly implementing liquid handlers. But what we wanted to do was actually fully integrate. We wanted to push all the way to the end of that spectrum and take it all the way from manual to fully integrated. A lot of times in modern labs these days, you see the manual and then you see the semi-automated. You might go into a lab and you'll see a Hamilton there. You might even see like a plate reader with a little robot, or you might see, you know, something feeding a plate washer, but you don't see the fully integrated platforms in, as often, unless you're in an HTS lab, unless you're in one of these big pharma screening groups. So why did we make that push? So really, one of the first things we thought about was we wanted to establish a culture early of automation. We wanted to really drive it into our scientists' minds that really the best way to execute experimentation these days is to use robotics, and that changes the way they think about experimental design. Now you might think, how many more variables can I test? Instead of maybe the high end or low end of a dose, can I test you know, a curve in between? Can I do more reps to power my statistics? Do I design my experiment differently instead of maybe putting it in tubes? Do I put it into a barcoded plate? Do I now, instead of doing 24 well, do I move it to 96, 3, 4, 15, 36? It changes the way that now your scientists might think about designing experimentation. The other thing that we really thought from a fully integrated platform that you get is fair data capture. It's a big buzzword these days, I know but I really don't think you're gonna to get to complete data capture unless you automate it. The example I talked about of the liquid handler just sitting there on the bench. So you've got a liquid handler, you walk up, you put your plates on it, it does its thing, you walk it over to the centrifuge, you press go, you run it for a certain amount of time and a certain amount of speed, and you should write that down, but you don't. It's a busy day in the lab, this happens to me all the time, and you just forget to write it down. A day later, you're going to type up your experimentation and you know what you were supposed, supposed to spin it at, but did you spin it at that speed? It's not captured anywhere. Whereas if you've got all of that on an integrated system, you can make sure you're capturing every step of the process. So then now you not only know the data that's generated, but everything that happens along the way. And you're never gonna get that complete metadata picture unless you automate that for the scientists. We're asking too much of our scientists otherwise, and they're not gonna record all of that. We just know that to be true. The next thing is we were really poised for pretty rapid growth. As I said, I was employee 26 or 27 when I started and we're almost at 200 about two and a half years later. So we knew we were gonna do a lot of hiring on the horizon but we didn't wanna hire people to just come in and be bored sitting at the bench pipetting from well one to well two. Those weren't the positions we wanted to hire for because they didn't set us up for the rapid growth that we're looking for. We wanted to hire specialists that could add value, that can build infrastructure here, that can build things at Beam, that set us up for long-term growth and success, not just bodies to get the science done. And then lastly is the ROI. Typically, you see this at the beginning of why fully automates. You know, the first things that come up are you can miniaturize, walk away time, instrument utilization. All those are really important and I don't discount those, but I don't think that they should be at the top of our ROI arguments anymore as to why we're fully integrating. I think we really need to look at some of the other things in addition to those when we're making these justifications. So why doesn't everybody fully automate? Well, it brings up this clip from Jurassic Park that I always think about a lot. You think that kind of automation is easy or cheap? Do you think that kind of automation is easy or cheap? There's probably a bunch of people watching this that kind of roll their eyes at, again, where we were a few years ago in a startup or a small space, and they think, okay, Bob, great. You were able to buy a high-res system. You know, they're expensive. What do I say to that? Well, I really think, again, as I started to say, we need to reevaluate our ROI metrics as we start to look at what's expensive. If you're in Cambridge or if you're in another biotech hub, people are expensive. Space is expensive. 
we feel like we get the most, the best utilization of our expensive components of space and people through automation. And so through that lens, then it starts to justify the expense. In addition, automation prices are coming down. I mean, the system costs, there's a few more vendors out there that you can use as you're working with integrators to pull pieces together that then starts to lower the cost and it becomes a little bit easier to implement these. It is, as it says in the clip there, do you think it's easy? It's not. I mean, some of this is pretty challenging. In the example I showed there of Ursula, we've got 11 different vendors on there. So we're having to use 11 different softwares to just even tie all of that together. That's not particularly easy. In addition, doing the science to robotics conversion is not trivial. Can your assay even be automated? How much development is gonna go into just even making the scientific area that you're exploring automatable? It's a pretty difficult technical challenge. Data tracking. I talked a lot about fair data and fair process standards that you're recording all of the metadata and everything that happens on your system. Well, setting up databases to store that, to then be able to retrieve it, to be able to visualize it, that's a little different skill set than traditional lab automation. So you have to have a skill set in there too that's going to help you build all of that data infrastructure, not just the hardware infrastructure that you need to execute all of this. And there's a lot more ch other challenges when you're looking to implement these fully integrated systems. However, I think all of this can be addressed. I think your friendly automation engineer, folks from me and my group here at Beam or from yours at your company, or you're probably that person at your company. And then you partner with successful integrators such as hi -Res, and it's just not that hard anymore. These systems are getting much easier to integrate than they were five, especially 10 years ago. They're getting a ton more robust. And I, I don't think the challenge really is going to be the things we listed there for the long term. But I think the challenges are different. I think the real challenges for integrated platforms is access. I think the complexity still drives away people from using them and makes it so that only specialists are the ones coming up and using these integrated systems. These things tend to still lie within cores, within HTS groups, within screening groups for whatever you're looking for at your company. And so you've got this complex, expensive device in a lab by itself and all of the science happening around it is still happening manually or semi-automated. We still aren't getting the traditional day-to-day -day molecular biology, in our case, done on these complex systems. So how do we do that? How do we make complex, complex more the new normal? How do we make it so that people are comfortable with them? How do we make scientists as comfortable with complex systems as they are with liquid handlers? And I think the answer is connectivity and the user interface. If you look at the right-hand side of the slide there, you'll see the Biomech method launcher. You'll see TCAN's user interface, Hamilton's user interface, Prime's user interface. Liquid handling companies know that being able to interface with your scientists is really important for getting them to adopt the equipment. We don't want our scientists to have to learn how to program in Python to use any of these things or C-sharp or whatever you're using. They need to have a user interface that makes it accessible and non-intimidating. And that's when I want to introduce Artificial's A-Lab Suite. I think you'll see then in the presentation that I give from here on out as I walk through this software package, that really the goal is then to make integrated systems connected and accessible. So before I get into what it does now, I want to talk a little bit about life before Artificial's A-Lab Suite. Here's a little schematic that I'll go through of a traditional NGS run. So if we've got you know, samples that are submitted to us from a scientist or that a scientist wants to run themselves, how do they do that? And for us, it all starts and ends in Benchling. It'll go into Hi-Res to be ordered up in Solario, executed on Ursula, and then AWS tools are used kind of throughout the process to track all the meta that, data that we've talked about. So let's go into that a little bit more in detail. So for us, everything starts in Benchling. If you're not familiar with Benchling, it's a cloud-based limb system. Um, in this case, I'm showing an example of an ELM where you might go in and design your experiment, set up your plates. You then might use their request module to then go in and request, in this case, a number of NGS samples that you'd like submitted to Ursula to be run. You then go into Hi-Res Solario system. And Solario is great. It's really easy to use for those of us that are automation engineers. But there's a couple things that just through our practices we find are difficult to translate over to our scientists at times. For one, if you look at the left-hand side of the screen, it's a list of methods. 
the scientist needs to go in and select the methods they would like to use. So let's say they want to do a DNA isolation. Do they pick DNA isolation version one or version one copy? Version two or version two copy incubate microserve? I can't imagine we're the only team out there that just has a hodgepodge of methods that we've all made edits to and changes to that are version two final dash final that is then really complex for people to come up to the instrument and know what the latest version is that they should use. Then there's a great UI within Solario where you go in and you drag your plates into the microserve, into the Ambi store, into your Lyconic, your Cytomat, whatever you're putting on your devices. But you have to know the plate type that is being used. You have to know the plate type in the method that's then going to be used later down the line. And again, it just forces our scientists to be more familiar with the methods than they typically are. Once it's all ordered up in Solario, then they go up to Ursula. And I think this is where the real challenge begins. You've got a scientist that is specialized in their domain, but not necessarily lab automation. And we're expecting them to come up to a device and know where to put Hamilton tips, where to put carriers, where to put troughs, how to put seals, peels, how to prime a multi-flow, how to use a mantis. There's a lot there on this system of a number of different companies that can be very daunting to then walk up and use if you're not intimate with this devices and using them every day. Then we've got a pretty complex, or not complex, but a good pipeline that then we use through AWS to make sure everything on Ursula is constantly being tracked, loaded up to the cloud, and then ultimately then delivered back to Benchling where it can be visualized and then things such as inventory can be updated and represented properly. So life before A-Lab was messy. It's a beautiful mess. I'm really proud of this. We put a lot of work into making it all uh, come together and it works great, but it's messy. It's intimidating. It's not particularly approachable that folks outside of our special circles, I mean, all of us at SLAS know all of these devices probably, we know how to use all of these things, but you go to a CRISPR conference and that's not gonna be the case. And those are my clientele here that I need to make sure that they can use this system. So life after A-Lab is powered in one place. Everything is within the A-Lab suite. Now we've got connectivity to Benchling where we can then design and think up our experiment, take it all the way through A-Lab, all the way through final data generation and capture. So what does that look like? Here's the first intro to A-Lab and it basically shows that it's a web-based app that allows access to your lab from any time, anywhere on any device. This is great. Anybody from our lab can then log in on your phone, on an iPad, on your Mac, on your PC, and we all see the same screen of pending work, system status, anything about our lab that we want to know, we can just go into a lab suite and find it. The next level down is then a lab ops. A lab ops then, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but allows us to connect to Benchling. It basically shows a list of all of the pending orders for any of the assays that we support on Ursula. It then allows us to go in and select the orders that we would like to select and batch them in whatever manner we want to. We can batch according to sample cost, turnaround time, whatever metric is important to you, you can then batch these orders. When you batch them then, it connects to Solario and then automatically places the order within Solario so you don't have to do that any longer. Once you've done that, then it takes you to A-Lab Assistant. And A-Lab Assistant is covering for that area where I said you have to walk up to Ursula and you're new to the system and you don't know what to do. I'm gonna give a demo of this so you can see exactly what it looks like, but it's gonna walk you through all of the specific steps of things that you really need to think about as you're loading a complex system such as ours. And it does it in a really beautiful interface, as you'll see. So this is kind of how it works for us at Beam. We've got at the beginning, the Benchling connectivity for everything. So as orders are placed in Benchling, they seamlessly sync to A-Lab. As they're batched within A-Lab during the ops process, all of that is fed back in a continuous loop and connectivity to Benchling so that then order statuses are changed, inventory is changed, metadata is tracked. It then connects seamlessly into our high-res Solario system and places that order for us so we're not even having to go into Solario. It'll then take us through to the assistant where then we can load up the devices. And what's really cool is then once you hit finish on the assistant in A-Lab, it's actually gonna start the instrument. So you don't even have to go into Solario to then start everything um, to get your data. So again, we're going all the way from experimental design 
connecting it all the way through execution and data generation all in one spot. So to show it kind of in action, some action shots of how we actually use this at Beam. On the left-hand side, again, another demo of the assistant. And what we do is we actually hold those on or use an iPad. And the iPad's got magnetic strips on the back of it that we've put on different devices. So you can see if you're going up to a Hamilton, you can stick it on there. It'll show you the schema and walk you through how to load everything you need to for the Hamilton, where the carrier should go, you know, where you should put your tips, where you should put your plates, your troughs, recording lot numbers. I'll show you all of this in the demo. You then take that iPad and you use it as a digital checklist as you walk around your system. So you take it over to your Ambi store, you take it over to your microserve, you take it over to your devices. And as you walk around the system, it's gonna walk you through everything you need to do to load the system and operate it properly. As it's doing that, it's also tracking all of the metadata. Who's doing it? Who's loading it? Did they actually do this step? Were there any issues that should be noted? Are there lot numbers that need to be recorded? Um, how many tips are being loaded or need to be loaded? All of that then is being visually presented to the user and recorded during this stage. All right, so let's get down to it. I'll actually give you a full demo. This goes really quickly, but I'll show you kind of what the entire ops and then assistant page looks like within a lab. So here's the home screen. You go in and you pick Ursula in this case to look at it. And here's all the pending orders. You can then batch those as I had said, and then choose run them right away, run them at a different point in time, or run them after a previous order. And then it's gonna give you all of the information you need pulled in from benchling of sample numbers, sample types, all of that. This is then the assistant screen. So you can see it'll go in and start to walk you through on the Hamilton, where do you put your carriers? Now it'll show you your tips. Do you have 144 tips on there? Do you have 406 of the clear one mil tips on there? So it tells you exactly how many tips you need loaded, where you put your nested tip racks, where you put your tips in the entry exit. One part I really like is I always forgot which trough was supposed to have which buffer in this assay. And so it walks you through exactly which one is supposed to have, exactly how much volume you're supposed to have in there with the dead volume that's calculated for that particular trough or carrier. It'll then allow you to put in the lot number as you could see there. And you can actually see it'll let you embed videos. So if there's a complex loading task that you wanna make sure gets right, that a uh, carrier gets pushed in all the way or that it gets left out like it should, you can highlight those via video. It's now gonna walk through all the rest of the system. So even if there's not something to be loaded, it's important to know, is there anything there? How many times have you left a plate on a device and then the robot goes to put something else on there and it crashes and it causes delays? Or how many times have you gone and you haven't checked that there's been a prime or that there's no you know, tips stuck in the way, that your waste is empty? It's gonna walk you through all of that. Here you can see it's walking you through a multi-flow. Uh, they've got beautiful 3D renderings of basically all of the devices so you know what you're looking at. And then here it'll walk you through, did you empty your waste, did you prime it? Now you can see it's actually going to walk you through the Ambi store and it's going to give you the exact stacker, the exact stacker location. Should A1 be facing out or facing in? That matters. It could put your plate completely backwards when it goes to stamp it if you don't specify things like that. And those are the kind of things that you don't think about unless it's elevated directly to you. Here's the microserve. You can see it actually like spins in the diagram. Uh, we have multiple colored plates. We have red, blue, clear plates. Those are all highlighted here. It's going to tell you exactly which stacker you need to put stuff in and how many of each labware type you need to operate this properly. Here you can see it's walking you through the other Hamilton. We have two Hamiltons on this integrated system. Again, Hamilton carriers can be moved. So you got to make sure those are in the right track or it's going to cause a big issue and a crash later on. The last thing it's going to walk you through are, say, peels, seals, labels. Here's one where, how often do you change out the peels? Once a month? So do you always remember how to do that? It'll prompt you with a video on how to actually change out the peels if that's something that needs to be done. And then when you hit finish here, it's gonna start the system. So at this point then everything initializes on the system, it starts to run and you can go back to then batching and planning your work. You don't have to do any interaction with Solaria. You don't have to go to any other software. It can all be controlled run and tracked within a lab. So we really feel like this is kind of the next level for lab automation and robotics is combining these 
integrated systems from HRB Robotics, and then the great connectivity and UI, making those accessible to the scientists when you're using the A-Lab suite. So thank you for listening to this. Uh, we'll be on the chat if you've got any questions. And a big thank you to our partners, Artificial and Hi-Res Biosolutions uh, for letting me talk today. Thank you.